So once again, thank you for being here and um, officially hello and welcome to the final event in this year's Food Dialogues. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Kurt Ackerman. I'm from the South African Urban Food and Farming Trust, and we are pleased to be hosting these events alongside our co-host and sponsor, Solve at the Waterfront, and our co-sponsor, the South African Center of Excellence in Food Security. Um, first hosted back in 2014, Food Dialogues is a program designed to help bring underrepresented and marginalized voices to the discussion of food system issues, to deepen our understanding of these issues and opportunities, to foster mutual understanding among diverse stakeholders, and to encourage ongoing collaboration in order to accelerate positive change of our food system. Last year in the Food Dialogues, we had 28 expert speakers and moderators across 51 sessions, engaging in 16 hours of recorded dialogue um, with nearly 900 participants. And I just wanna share a br few brief highlights. Actually, you know what, in the interest of time, because we started so late, I'll post the link to those highlights and you can watch them at your own, um, at your own leisure. Um, for 2021, this year, we took last year's event as a point of departure for bringing further diversity of voices into the dialogue regarding our food system. We turned away from exclusive engagement with the experts and toward the lived experiences of individuals who engage in their own ways with the food system daily and over the course of their lifetimes. And in our own ways, we're all experts and that we all eat and each have our own intimate knowledge of our food lives. And our format was a bit different, still pandemic constrained, and we find there are many more conversations happening on different platforms this year compared to last year, leading to a fair amount of virtual meeting fatigue and the occasional technical hitch, um, but which also is a hopeful indicator of interest in and recognition of the importance of our food system to people and planet both locally and around the world. Um, in addition to thanking our co-host and sponsors, I said Solve at the Waterfront and our co-sponsor, the DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Food Security, for making this year's Food Dialogues possible, I want to add an important thank you to our partners as well. Um, these include the African Center for Cities, the Southern Africa Food Lab, ICLEI Africa, the City of Cape Town, the Western Cape Government, the Western Cape Economic Development Partnership, the Iranizic City Farm and Market, and the Derek Creative Agency. And of course, thanks to you for being here. So we kicked off this year's Food Dialogues over a month ago on the 6th of September with a series of 10 remarkable interviews of people from all walks of life, sharing their stories and experiences. We had a great panel discussion on the 21st um, with three of these people, and that was moderated by journalist and author Leonie Joubert. We then had another fascinating panel discussion the next day on the 22nd with three amazing African chefs who used the medium of food to explore how a plate of food connects us to our society and our culture, to one another, to memory, to our economy, and to our future. And that was moderated by writer and food activist Ishe Govender. We had hoped we'd actually do more than talk about food, but share plates of food. Unfortunately, the pandemic restricted us to doing that virtually this time. Next year, we will actually cook and eat together as part of the food dialogues. Um, if you happen to miss these or any part of them or want to rewatch any of them or this, um, you can do that at the Food Dialogues platform at fooddialogues.info or at the YouTube channel, the Food Dialogues YouTube channel. And we've prepared an excellent short video summary of some of these key moments and insights. Um, that's being launched today, and it's available on all the Food Dialogues platforms, and I'll put the link into the chat uh, over the course of the, se the session today. And today our focus shifts yet again um, within our food system to consider the dynamics between global events and, and local realities. And as many of you know, on the 23rd of September, the UN can be the UN Food System Summit, which was billed as a forum to advance the global conversation on and drive action to transform the way the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. This forum was highly contested from diverse quarters, highlighting key fault lines, giving insight into the dynamics of our global food system and raising important questions for Cape Town, including what contributions do these events really make to addressing our own local concerns. And our panel today draws on the recent staging of this UN Food System Summit in order to unpack ways in which major global events like this are relevant locally, how these global local dynamics help illuminate um, our problems and opportunities in Cape Town, and what lessons and insights can assist with the challenges we face in our local food system. And to help us engage with these issues, we are so fortunate to have today with us a remarkable panel moderated by Professor Julian May, He's director of the DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Food Security and is the UNESCO Chair in African Food Systems at the University of the Western Cape. And he's joined by our panelists who I'll introduce briefly in alphabetical order. Um, we are, we hope to be joined. Um, oh, he's with us, sorry. Um, Jean-Paul Adam is the Director of Technolo for Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resources Management in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA. 
Prior to taking on this role, he served in the government of the Republic of Seychelles in several cabinet positions. We welcome Jean-Paul. And next we have Namonde Boutelezi, who is an urban farmer based in Cape Town, cultivating organic crops in her township for sale to the local community. She's also an early childhood educator by training and is a food justice activist, coordinator of community-led food systems research projects. And she has co-published a number of opinion papers and research articles and is the co-founder and head of the food agency Cape Town called FACT and collaborates with the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Cape Town on food justice research. We're also joined by Jane Battersby, who is a human geographer with an interest in all things food related. She's been at the University of Cape Town in various capacities since joining as a postdoc in 2003, but most recently as an associate professor at the African Center for Cities and is currently in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences. And rounding out our panel is Solfina Nikesa, who is a professional officer in urban systems at ICLE Africa. She's formerly qualified as an architect and urban planner and recently coordinated a series of high-level food systems dialogues across 15 African cities for the UN Food and Agriculture Organization in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit. And as I said before, everybody eats, we all have a say in our food system and we wanna hear from you as well. So please use the Q and A function um, in Zoom for your questions. Feel free to comment in the chat and to discuss things amongst yourselves within the chat. That won't be used for the questions, but feel free to do that. And again, we'll keep an eye on the Q&A and feed that in. So thanks for your patience in listening to me. And um, I will now hand over to Julian and enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Well, good, afternoon. good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session. I'm really excited about this. I've been looking forward to it all, all, all week and uh, spent a few hours this morning making notes and preparing. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, when we were doing a preparatory meeting, Kurt uh, made the comment, well, this is the meeting of the food geeks. And uh, I had to, have to admit, I'd never really thought of myself as a food geek until that comment. And uh, it made me think, well, that's one I'd be really interested to find out how the panelists themselves managed to get themselves into a position to be described in a term such as that. So let me start with Sorafina. We've heard the formal introduction, but what was your pathway to this panel? Uh, thanks, Julian. And maybe I, I wouldn't call myself a food geek. I'd call myself the food connector because really all, all, all I do is, is, is to make the linkages whenever I can. You know, I started off in architecture and then um, slowly moved into urban planning. Uh, but really what I've been following is the resources, uh, you know, the resources that feed into the architecture profession that led me to the wider urban space, um, you know, and then eventually kind of brought me to a smaller space of food. You know, all these resources feed you know, they come from the natural environment and eventually feed into our cities and feed into our systems. Water, energy, uh, you know, all these are resources that I kept following across all these dip uh, different disciplines that, um, that have been explored. Wonderful, I think that's very interesting. And Jane, what's your story? Yeah, I'm an accidental food geek, but I'm, I'm a fully food geek now. So I, I got into food entirely by accident. Um, I came out of a background of doing research on hip hop as a post-colonial text and a PhD on education and identity, and then had a bit of a, a funding gap. And so I ended up in a project that was doing research on urban food security. And the moment I started looking at data and realized just how deep the problem was, the fact that what was always said was the solution didn't appear to be. So we only in the locations we're working and we only found 5% of people growing their own food, but that was that the entry point of government at the time. And the fact that although the notion was that supermarkets provided cheaper, more diverse foods, people weren't using those as the, the main point of reference, even though they could just put in so many questions about geography and equity and all those kind of dynamics. And so food has kind of been the thing that I hook those really big questions onto. Right, and, and Namandi, your, your story? How did you become a food geek? Or are you a food geek? Uh, <laughs> I used to be a plant lady. <laughs> um, so no, I wouldn't call myself a food geek. But yeah, I've got many stories um, and we don't have enough time for that. But um, um, uh, as, a, as an ex um, kindergarten practitioner, um, I, I went to a world of college. And at the college, we are taught to educate the child holistically. So that's taking mind of taking care of the mind, the body, and the soul. So taking care of the body means um, making sure that at the kindergarten the children are served healthy and nutritious meals. Which, so as someone staying in the township, I know even from growing up from personal experiences that is that is not happening. So we were encouraged to start a small garden at home or at the kindergarten itself to be able to harvest and actually cook 
So through that, I've also had some um, health scares myself and the doctors was like, you should eat organic food. That was the first time the term was, was introduced to me. So I went searching for organic food. It took me out of my township to actually find the food that is labeled organic. And when I look at the prices, I walk right out of the store until um, I saw a poster that says training on how to grow your own food organically. Since then I've caught the virus. Um, I've been growing food, I've been experimenting, whatever, whenever I'm at the place and I see a seed, I take it home and see if I can, I can try to grow it. So, um, and then the, the, by chance, uh, I became a food activist because I started noticing certain foods that I would like to eat that were not available where I live. And then the question of why, you know, why should I have to travel to town to a certain shop to actually get what I would like to eat? And also, but what actually brought me here today in this platform was the frustration of the food parcels that were happening during COVID. So yeah, that is, I guess, why I am here today. Thank you. Well, Jean-Paul, you're joining us from Rwanda, but you're originally from Seychelles, which has a very different food environment. What's been well, your journey to? Well, I have to start by talking about, about fish, and um, because that's, uh, that, that's the story growing up for anyone from Seychelles. You grow up on a diet of fish, fish, and more fish. And uh, in, the, in the late 70s and 80s in Seychelles, the, the cargo ships came very rarely. And uh, even though there is local meat production, fish was very much the most uh, accessible uh, source of protein. And that's what everyone depended on. And it, and it was fantastic because you know, it was fresh and absolutely wonderful uh, in terms of the quality. And one of the best uh, scenarios in Seychelles is to catch your own fish and then grill it on the beach itself. And that's one of the simple joys in, in, in life, I think. And I think that's what, um, for me, um, is important about food is the best food is simple, it's accessible. And uh, it's, it's about sharing of, uh, of experiences. And where my, my interest led from that um, early experience was that I, at that time in the 80s and early 90s, Seychelles also started to invest in uh, five-star quality hotels and tourism was really taking off. And uh, I had friends sometimes, uh, I remember one, one uh, friend that came to visit or rather a relative, they stayed in a really nice hotel and they said, well, oh, the, but the food is not good. The fish is really not good. And so, of course, we took them uh, to, have, uh, to have fish in one of the local stalls, which, of course, was a completely different experience. And that's when I realized and I started digging and I understood that um, good quality food, which is sometimes made by local producers, sometimes struggle to actually enter into value chains. Uh, and uh, this has since changed in Seychelles. Now there's a real link between the local production and, for example, the luxury tourism experience. Uh, but these things don't necessarily all happen automatically. And there's, I think, a lot of uh, effort that sometimes needs to be made to connect quality local producers and national value chains. And I think one of the things I'd really like to talk about today is how we, we link those really in the, in, the, in the region, in Africa, and how we look at that. You're certainly talking about the subject in the right city, coming from your background, because the, the Western Cape is one of the few areas in South Africa where fish is very much part of our diet. And fisher communities are among some of the most vulnerable in the in, in our communities. Okay, so Jane, you've actually won a prize in in food systems. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? I mean, what on earth is a food system anyway? Yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the the prize was a prize for mid career academics working on sustainable food systems issues, um, and in fact, they are crowning the next um, appointee tonight, and I'll be speaking of that. But yeah, I think this question of what a food system is, is quite a complex question, and there's lots of definitions. So the definition that I use is one from the UN FAO's high-level panel of experts. And that definition, and I'm gonna read it just because it's complex, is a food system gathers all the elements, environment, people, inputs, processes, infrastructures, institutions, etc and activities that relate to the production, processing, distribution, preparation, and consumption of food, and the outputs of these activities, including socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. So it's not just about production, and it's not just about all the items along the value chain, but about the systems that feed into that and the outcomes of that. And oftentimes I think we've ended up in a situation where conversations about food security are separated from conversations about food systems. And so just last year, the high level panel of experts released a, a new document thinking about food security and food systems for the 2030 agenda. 
saying we need to expand our understanding of food security from being about providing availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability, which have been the kind of four, four key pillars for the last 20 or so years, and saying but that also needs to happen in the context of sustainability, so within a sustainable food system, and I think more broader sort of sustainable urbanism, etc., and also where there's agency, where people have control within that food system, where they have the power to determine how they're going to engage that system and indeed shape the system. Thanks. Well, that's interesting because uh, the, the UN Food Summit um, put a lot of emphasis on the idea that it was also a people's dialogue. Um, and there was, a, a, across the world, there were efforts to try and set up um, dialogues in different countries and different continents. Uh, so, Lafina, you were involved in some of that. Uh, yes, Julian. So we were involved in ICLI Africa and uh, Partners FAO. We conducted um, over 16 multi-stakeholder dialogues uh, involving uh, 26 uh, local governments, um, both in Africa, but then also in South America, in Europe, as well as Southeast Asia and North America as well. And then what was interesting is that of those uh, 16 local governments, 12 of them were African cities. So there was such a huge um, sort of interest and then uh, sort of a huge lobbying to get African cities and African voices onto, onto, the summit, uh, onto the summit platform. And what this meant to the cities, I think that is something that I would like to, to delve on as the conversation um, grows. Okay. Do you think it was successful in getting, in getting more engagement and, and having more, more voices brought to the dialogue? I think to me it was successful as a first step in, um, in first of all, getting people on board to understanding the food system, to linking different stakeholders in the food system, but then also voicing um, commitments on where they would want uh, to take the food system forward. However, in terms of, um, of getting stronger commitments in of how do we move forward from what was voiced, what were the challenges that were voiced, I felt there was a bit of a lack. You know, um, I felt the lack came in when we're not getting, for example, multi, uh, multilateral organization or more international organization committing resources, committing actually money to move forward um, some of the outputs from the dialogues, committing, um, committing skilled manpower to be able to move forward some of the, of, 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 of the conversations from the dialogue, as well as committing concrete resources to different local governments to be able to, uh, to move forward. So to me, that was the big gap. But in terms of creating a platform to start conversations, it was, um, it, it was a good start. I think going forward, it can be a platform to deepen conversation, but then to also deepen conversations linked to action because we've been uh, going over the problems over quite a long period of time, but now we need action and resource, resources to enable action to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So while the preparations for the food summit were taking place um, across the world, we were all experiencing significant hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns. And uh, I'm curious from Namandi, from your perspective, um, as someone involved in, 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 in some of the efforts to try and deal with the issues of hunger and of, of malnutrition that started to emerge more strongly during the, the, the period of COVID, how relevant do you think these discussions are to what you experienced? And, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about your experiences over the last year, um, trying to mitigate some of the impacts of the lockdown. Thank you. Um, well, what I've experienced, especially during the, the last year, uh, was that um, as someone who was in the bracket of um, um, being poor and um, being vulnerable, um, given the conditions that we stay in in the township, there was a lot of conversation that was actually happening. There was a lot of decisions being taken um, on how to actually assist and how to intervene, but they were not happening. We were not being consulted. You know, they were happening about me, but I was being discussed, um, but not with me. So, um, and whatever aid that actually came, um, it was just a band-aid, you know, it was just fixing um, the current situation, for instance, with the food, we were just, you know, we were being fed, so the bellies were being full, were being full. But what about the social issues that we actually, because quite a lot um, uh, uh, came up. Uh, we 
did a research, we conducted a research and with a conversation, because while you're doing a survey, you actually start a conversation with someone. We, we also noticed a lot of um, domestic abuse, you know, a lot of gender-based violence was actually erupted because now everyone is cooped up um, in this small space. So there's, there's, there's just a lot um, that is happening. So it, it was, it really became a frustration that I was fortunate enough to be, to be able to log in to these online dialogues from me, um, um, curiosity and also by chance that I would get a link um, and then I would come in and I would, I'd be like a fly on the wall and I would want to say something. One, I'm intimidated by the platform. One, it's the language. Um, I do not understand what is it. By the time I'm starting to grasp, I mean, I, I, I'm not fluent in English, but I can converse, you know, I'm quite comfortable in talking and I would put myself in a place of a neighbor that would be fortunate to come into the platform and, and actually not understand and not being able to, to say anything. So uh, with the summit, it was exactly for me the same. In the panel that I was in, um, I was so nervous and I was saying to, um, to the moderator that I am feeling very nervous, but she said to me, you know, just be you. And I didn't quite understand any of the other speakers. You know, the, it was all this academic language that I couldn't understand, but I was comforted by the feedback that I received to say, you were one authentic voice. You spoke from the heart and we could relate to you. So we, those are the kind of things that we want. You know, those are the kind of things that we relate to. I mean, there's all this jargon, this academic, yes, they're professors, sorry, Jane. Um, yes, um, they're educated, but try to speak a language that, you know, we will all understand. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, in, in some ways, I'm sure there were many regrets that the Food Summit took place in the year of the lockdowns. We expected perhaps more or different. There were many things that couldn't take place. But it's also allowed us to think about the idea of how do we build back? And that's not just build back following COVID. How do we build back as we try and think about climate change? Uh, Jean-Paul, you've been working on this somewhat. Could you give us some ideas from, from, from what you've been doing? Yes, thank you, Julian. And I think that what the COVID-19 pandemic has done is it has exposed the wider weaknesses of um, our, of our, we'd say our governance uh, systems and our development systems, but particularly um, in Africa, the food systems. Uh, and the, uh, one of the things that uh, among the work that we have done at the Economic Commission for Africa has shown that uh, agriculture in Africa in particular and food production is going to be severely impacted by, by climate change. Um, some of the main crops uh, that uh, are currently being produced in, in Africa, including maize, including cassava, uh, could have drops in yields of up to 20% by 2050, uh, based on rates of warming, on, based, based even on current rates of warming, which are set to exceed the 1.5 degrees increase. So the, and then that's coupled with a situation where African food production generally tends to be inefficient compared to um, compared to, let's say, other regions of the world. And we, uh, we have the problem of uh, having, in many cases, very good quality food production happening across the continent, but the connection with, the, with markets is not necessary there. There's the challenges of urbanization and being able to feed people in these vastly growing uh, urban spaces um, in, in a manner which is uh, secure. Uh, there's the quality of the food that uh, is, is being produced. And then there's also the threat of anti-competitive uh, trade practices, which uh, when Africa has, uh, African countries have taken the decision to be, uh, I would say, to, to be active within the global trading system, it has also left African countries often and producers at the mercy of uh, anti-competitive practices, which uh, have, have undermined the uh, the ability of of, uh, of uh, communities to invest in sustainable food production. So we uh, we have actually we issued a report in the in, in March of this year called uh, Building Forward for an African Green Recovery, and this really looked at it looked at several sectors uh, as being the the areas of focus for um, building more resilience into our into our development systems. And uh, energy was one of the core areas, but uh, food systems and, and particularly 
um, climate smart agriculture was the the second uh, was the second sort of pillar in terms of being able to address climate resilience across the continent. And if we have more efficient uh, uh, ability to to support um, African food producers, uh, we can link this firstly with the protection of the natural environment. We should recognize that Africa currently has the, the highest rate of loss of forest cover um, of all regions of the world. Uh, and a large part of this is linked to agriculture. And it's not because the, uh, and, and the issue is because the, the, the types of agriculture that we're doing are generally um, inefficient. Uh, by improving access to energy alongside uh, investments in agriculture, uh, by improving as well uh, the predictable access to markets, ensuring that there is appropriate access to finance, and also ensuring that there is uh, appropriate spaces for the development of both industrial scale agriculture and small scale, small and medium enterprises, which, which all have a very key role to play uh, within the value chain. And the, the final point is the, the ability therefore to look at uh, using uh, trading standards through the African continental free trade area to really define the kind of uh, food production and food trade that we want to have on the continent, which is focused around uh, efficiency, uh, the quality of those products, fair prices uh, for producers, and of course, uh, ensuring that there is uh, food security for, for people who currently uh, are food insecure. Thank you, that, that gives us a nice high level view of what might be the opportunities and options for, for um, African countries and African cities. But I thought I'd like to go to Namandi and say, I'll ask you to perhaps say something about your perspective of the Cape Town food system. And, you, and you've indicated that you've, you've engaged with that, Cape, with that food system in different ways. That makes it perhaps different from other places in Africa that someone like Jean-Paul would need to take account of as to what is unique about a city like Cape Town. And it doesn't have to be something positive. It could be something negative, whatever you feel you'd like to draw our attention to. <laughs> well, um, what I see, um, um, I see something wrong with the food system um, in Cape Town. Um, from the description that Jane actually um, described um, earlier, I think there, there's a broken chain. There are some elements that are missing, you know, there's no inclusivity. For instance, um, there is no link. I do not see any link. What, I've, what I'm observing is that the city itself doesn't see um, small scale producers as, as, um, as people or as an industry that can actually survive and that can actually feed um, the city. They are pushing for commercializing. They are pushing for, um, for, for, for large producers, um, they, there is actually no support. We struggle as small producers to get support from our own city. So we push, you know, we, we, we develop local, local led um, uh, organizations and, and we push and we try to have a voice. Currently, we are starting a series of dialogues and we are actually taking these dialogues to the people because um, when I'm having a conversation with someone, um, and I would say, here's a small farmer, they are growing and you're not supporting them. At the end of the month, you take the bulk of your money to a superstore. You don't even know the owner of the superstore. You are making a rich man even richer. Why do you not support you know, the, small, um, the small scale farmer right next to you? And I'm not really getting a definite answer. So I think that's actually where this whole thing is broken. I do not see why we should struggle um, to, to to, to get through to them. I do not see why we should struggle. Um, in fact, for anything, why do we have to, to take to, to the streets um, in this sense on, on online platforms to actually, because you have to engage. We've had numerous, numerous meetings with the city of Cape Town, with, with, with the mayor's, um, the, his committee. And, you know, there are promises. Um, and also from an agricultural point of view, um, we struggle to get assistance in terms of input um, and infrastructure. When we manage to have a meeting with them, and and they would say they would say, yeah, but um, you need land tenure, you know, you need water access, and it's not our department. So we would say, okay, they are your sister departments. In the next meeting, can you call them? 
that will not happen. So they are just stalling. There's there's something really really wrong with the with the food system in Cape Town. Lafine, have you heard similar comments from other in, in other cities in Africa? I think um, what 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 was surprising throughout the dialogues as um, across um, African cities was um, was first of all some of the similarities that do strongly come through. Um, for example, in the in the Kisumu and, and Nairobi dialogue, these are both um, East African countries in Kenya. I mean, East African cities um, best that are in Kenya. You know, there's there's quite a dominance of informal actors along the food value chain, and so these are involved in production. These are involved in uh, small scale uh, processing, and these are involved in food vending in the city. But whenever, uh, for example, when we looked at, at, at the recently launched uh, Nairobi. Um, Draft draft policy, you know, you you find that there was a draft food uh, system policy that was that was recently published. Is that you find there's such a missing uh, there's such a missing gap or there's a missing link uh, between uh, between trying to uh, to bring between understanding who exactly is influencing the food system and how they can be fully resourced. You know, uh, you find that small scale actors and informal actors are playing such a big role in moving food, in producing food, and also in um, in consuming food, but when it comes to policy and high-level documents, um, they they are not being mentioned. You know, there's it's, it's almost that it's almost like that industry does not exist at all, or that that whole sector does not exist at all. And 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 and, and a lot of challenges were also expressed by the city. You know, um, you know this one of them was this these these are termed as informal. Do we still want to encourage them? But then the question was that, but they are already um, addressing issues that the city is not able to address. For example, um, um, enabling the access of affordable food, even if it may not necessarily be the most nutritious, uh, but it is affordable food. So I think cities are grappling with that challenge of how do we, um, how do we support informal, termed as informal businesses uh, without necessarily having to, to um, to, 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 to compromise the, 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 the functioning or the legalities of the city. So that was one, one, one question that kept, kept coming up across the dialogues, you know, how, um, how to incorporate informal actors, but then also the recognition that, that small, small scale actors are playing such a key role, but they're lacking access to finance. And this is, uh, for example, accessible, but then also uh, flexible financial models. And we saw that, for example, in, in, in the West African and East African cities, there are mobile money platforms, you know, where th that allow access to, uh, to, different, um, to, 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 to different quantities of money, but they are not being um, innovated to allow a, a more innovative access to finance for, for food system actors. So there's need to, to start um, building certain models that are already in place, you know, such as mobile money that target um, Small scale actors within the city, but then also cities have to be more forward about uh, trying to um, trying to access finance or trying to create platforms or building onto a system such as the the circles. So these were small saving societies that we are working for farmers in rural areas, but can still be adopted to work for small scale actors within the urban areas. So if you would ask me whether uh, local governments do know how to deal with um, small-scale actors and informal sector yet, I don't think they do. And I think um, in some of the work that, um, that, that Jane has done, you know, they've, they've, they've explored this question and maybe she can also um, build upon that, you know, in some of the studies they've done in, in the different cities. So I'll, I'll take the gap. Thanks, Olafina. Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think there are some real commonalities and differences between the Cape Town context and some of the other cities we've worked in. And so the things that Solofina was talking about, about how cities don't really know how to incorporate the informal sector and often have quite negative perceptions of the, the informal sector through how it's been portrayed historically. And so one of the big differences, I think, in the Cape Town and South African context is we're much further along in the supermarket transition. Okay, so a lot of the other cities, the, 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 the supermarkets are still establishing themselves as these kind of dominant forces within the cities. And yet within a Cape Town context, they, they really are very much determining kind of what the food system looks like and making it appear as if there is kind of no alternative. And so what I think we, we've got to do is 
is understand how how and why we've ended up in this in this situation. And so I think you know going back to the the questions about the UN Food System Summit, one of the critiques of the summit was that it it looks for game changing solutions without understanding structural drivers. And I think if we start to look at kind of the structural drivers of food system change in South Africa, there's, there's colonial policy, there's apartheid spatial planning, um, there's the kind of deregulation we saw in the 1990s that opened up the, the door to the kind of corporatization of, of that food system. And so if we're starting to think about who do you then include in the conversation about change, you've got to recognize the power dynamics that are in the room um, and find ways to, to kind of bring not an equal footing. We don't need an equal footing because there's those who already have power will continue to assert their power. It's about finding spaces for, for real dialogue that recognize how people do actually access food in the city and where their agency begins and ends and try to en enhance that. Um, and I think we, we've got significant challenges in the South African context because our system is so already concrete, corporatized and, and concentrated. Jean-Paul, in, in the role that you played in both now and the Economic Commission for Africa, but also when you were in government in the Seychelles, I'd expect you, you, you frequently had to deal with things such as this. We, we often, in, 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 in Cape Town, we often talk about uh, the notion of difficult partnerships where, where power is unequal, where in fact views may be contesting. Your thoughts on how, any way in which we can try and address this in, 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 in our context? Well, the first thing that I, I would say, I mean, there's, I think we have to look at food systems uh, beyond perhaps sometimes the romantic notion that we have of, of, of food systems. I think that uh, there, I would say almost uh, without question, there will be a further industrialization of food production across Africa. And it will be very difficult to achieve the levels of food security that we would need to have um, without um, a, a um, I would say, a much bigger investment in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure for, for example, transportation, storage of food, and that includes as well on the retail space. And so I think um, what Jane has just described in terms of supermarkets um, dominating the space, I think it's, it's going to happen as well. Um, it, it's something that will happen gradually as well over the, over the continent. And I think the questions, therefore, we need to ask ourselves is how do we define the space in a way whereby um, the, those more um, uh, corporate systems are nonetheless creating opportunities for local producers and that there is involvement in the value chain, and also how we carve out a space to ensure that there are uh, spaces for SMEs in urban areas to be properly involved in, in, in food production. And there are different levers uh, that, uh, that can be used. Um, first of all, if I go to the experience of, of Seychelles, we've certainly seen an evolution in how people um, uh, consume food and primarily fish, where fish would traditionally be bought directly from the fishermen and usually directly on the beach. Uh, fishermen would arrive, sell their fish directly from the boat. Uh, that still happens, but because people now tend to live also in, in flats and so on, they tend to have, they tend to also want to buy their their, their fish, uh, so they will buy fresh fish, uh, sometimes from the market, sometimes from the fishermen, but they'll also be buying frozen fish and so on. So there is that, that uh, and we can expect that that will further uh, be strengthened over a period of time. What we did in Seychelles was we did try through finance to strengthen the opportunity for involvement of the fishermen themselves uh, in that uh, to better, uh, better be, better have a, uh, a say in agency on, for example, on price setting. And one of the things that we did in uh, 2018 was uh, Seychelles issued a blue bond, uh, which is a financial instrument, which is a sovereign bond, and essentially it allowed foreign investors to invest in what was essentially a, 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 a debt instrument by the government of Seychelles. But the proceeds were designed, so part of the proceeds were given to environmental conservation groups, and part of the proceeds were re reserved uh, as uh, low interest loans to be given to fishing entrepreneurs to improve their capacity, for example, to invest in cold storage so that they wouldn't have to just sell their catch the same day, that they would have capacity to save some of their fish and then sell it onward uh, to be involved in, in low level processing and basically to use some of that financing to 
give them a stronger position on the value chain and ensure that there was not just the dominance of these, uh, these bigger seafood processes. So I think the, uh, a few people have talked about the access to finance, for example, for uh, SMEs. And I think that is one way by providing affordable finance uh, with, which, which is very clearly directed to sort of gaps in the, in the value chain, uh, you can actually create opportunities and strengthen the role of, of small and medium enterprises in the value chain. Thank you. Well, I, mean, I, I was interested in that response. Um, some years ago, I had the opportunity to work in the Maldives. And one of the concerns there was, as the food system changed, and this is particularly about the purchase of, of, of fish from, from fishes out at sea and taking onto factory boats, was the unintended consequences that this resulted in. In the case of Maldives, this was an increase in, in, in anemia among, among women and issues of, of, of nutrition. Um, and the Monday, I was interested, I, I noted in, in that you at some point were involved in the early development or early childhood development. Um, and essentially that was my pathway into, into, in, into being a food geek was concerned about levels of malnutrition among children. Um, so we are concerned about the, the, the unintended consequences of what we do and how that might impact upon others who pay the cost of some people's progress. What is the situation in the area you live? What, 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 what is the situation with children? Um, it's actually quite bad. Uh, we, I do not have the actual figures or the statistics, but um, we have high numbers of high school dropout. In fact, primary school dropout. We, um, even in, in my family as well, we have a lot of, uh, we have children with um, learning disabilities and that those numbers are increasing. We have children that are malnutrition, you know, they are born really, really small. And through research, um, we've actually established that um, that is um, through the bad diet that the mother eats um, while pregnant. And that is due to the availability or the non-availability of the healthy food and also the lack of knowledge. Um, and there's also the, the consumption of alcohol while the the mother is pregnant or smoking or um, abusing um, these um, substances. So, but that is also through the lack of knowledge. So I was fortunate to actually um, go to a world of college and we are actually, you know, trained um, and taught to deal with the children that actually has learning disabilities. But it becomes a concern because when the child leaves your space, they go to a mainstream school and they do not make it there. So that is why also we have such high levels of crime. Um, the children are unable, they cannot cope at school. They are unemployable. They do not have any skills. So they, there's also nothing else to do for them in the township. So there's really lack of knowledge. Um, and there's also this thing of, um, which we're also trying to debunk that, um, organic food, you know, food that is actually labeled organic, that it's actually, um, it, it's, it's to grow organic food is to not use commercial pesticides, but it's, it's more about having access to healthy food, having access to nutritious food. Um, and it shouldn't be labeled as food that is expensive, you know, because the way that you grow food, the way that food was grown back in the days in the Eastern Cape, that is a healthy and nutritious food itself. But it's, it's not easily accessible. I made a, a practical example of um, um, yesterday, we drove to the peninsula um, and we spoke to an organic farmer there in Ocean View and we had a lady from Masikumelele that we also work with um, in Food Agency Cape Town. And this conversation actually came up of, um, there are certain foods, you know, she's, she's a Zimbabwean national and there's, we have quite a lot of foreign nationals staying in our township, but, they, you know, sometimes they've had to ship food from, um, from their own countries in order for them to be able, because what they need or what they would want to eat is not available where they live. And they, they, they just don't know, they, first they don't know if there's a point to speak up, will someone listen? They are foreign nationals, they're not South Africans. Will that be even be regarded? But as South Africans, we're actually facing the same challenges. People notice, that they, I would want to eat this, but it's not there, but can I actually say something? You know, so they don't know whether it is or not to say something, yeah. Okay. I think that 
one of the things that was very interesting was a statement in the UN Food Summit that they, they generated, I think, game-changing ideas. And in the, they say they have about 2,200 game changes. Jane, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to, to reflect on some of these ideas about game changing and whether they are game changes that you think are, are either were discussed or were not picked up that we should be thinking about that could perhaps firstly address some of the things that Jean-Paul talked about, um, the, 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 the opportunities that might exist, but also the concern that we've just heard now about the unintended consequences of some of those opportunities and who bears the costs of those. Yeah. And so this is the thing. So, so the UN Food Systems Summit solicited game-changing ideas from, from the multitude. So anybody could submit. Um, and the, for me, the process wasn't clear about how those ideas were being gathered and whose ideas were going to gain credence and, and, and whether, you know, some of the ideas that seem to be on the table, I think are probably at odds with each other, right? And so how, how are we making sense of that? And, and you know, I was on the site this morning just looking at the commitments to action and there's over, there's 230 odd commitments to action that have been made across the, the various streams. But at the moment, they're, they're, they're simply things that have been put down on, on, on paper. I know there's been significant financial sort of recommendations, but a lot of that is around kind of the same old, same old big production points. Um, I think where there is an interesting energy is there have been a number of coalitions that have been formed that will take a kind of a longer term framing to try and think through where some of the solutions might lie and trying to build a kind of common, common understanding of a problem, build up momentum and seek change in particular areas. So I'm, I'm in the, there's an urban food systems one that's been, that's been launched and there's a school food one that's, that's been launched. So I think that that's probably where the entry points are. My concern, like I said earlier with the game changers is that they often come out of a problem seen in the moment and not understood in the context. And so, you know, it's, it's almost like we're looking for fundable band-aid solutions to much deeper, deeper challenges. Can I add that idea to Salafina or to Jean-Paul? Because you've also must be thinking about the game changes that you've heard about in your sessions. Let's ask Salafina first. And it's, to me, it's not even an idea. It's 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 a question that, that that I want to put forward. That I and I also raised forward at the start where I saw the gap here. And and maybe I can I can raise it to to, to Jean Paul here. You know, as 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 one who who, who is involved in the in the United Nations Economic Commission um, for Africa, I'm, I believe there's there's a lot of mobilizing power around uh, getting the right resources around uh, getting more organization, putting money where people's mouths are and, you know, literally. So what are some of these follow-up actions after the Food Systems Summit? Because we are at a point where we need, um, you know, co commitments beyond, um, commitments beyond words, but really commitments that are financed. You know, what are some of these, um, where are we getting the money and who is providing it? And then how are we capacitating uh, especially local governments, but then also coming to the ground. I think uh, we need to, to capacitate different levels, the local governments, but then also the citizens, you know? Um, how, how, how are such commissions looking at it? I think that's my cue to come in. And uh, I, I perhaps um, might start with a bit of pessimism, but I'm hopefully I will end on a bit of optimism. Um, the pessimistic um, uh, view, and uh, it's, I think, just uh, a statement of fact, is that we have to understand that currently the finance generally for development is actually falling. Um, and this is uh, partly due to COVID, where um, revenues uh, in countries that would traditionally give uh, financing, um, are, are, their, their revenues are, are falling, and a lot of uh, countries that would traditionally commit um, are, are actually uh, not committing as much. Uh, there's also something which is happening, which is perhaps going a little bit below the radar, uh, but this was reported by the um, OECD, is that uh, the while countries sometimes are announcing new increases, for example, in climate finance, uh, this actually sometimes is diverting resources from elsewhere. And the overall net result is currently negative. Uh, and that does mean that it is uh, uh, harder 
to, uh, to mobilize specific resources for, for example, investment in food systems. Um, on the optimistic uh, side, I think that there is more and more uh, an understanding that uh, even, for example, food systems, you can't look at food systems in isolation without looking at uh, access to energy, um, access to finance. Um, you, you can't look at it as well without looking at uh, sanitation, particularly in the water and sanitation in the urban environment. And there are uh, perhaps uh, there is a better understanding that the way we intervene must not be in silos and that there are opportunities, for example, to invest in food production in cities which are simultaneously addressing a number of other issues, including uh, improving, I mean, just for example, having uh, uh, farm spaces in, within, within urban environments can help actually reduce temperature, can help reduce uh, uh, pollution uh, and, uh, and, and address a number of, uh, of other issues. So I think there's uh, cross-cutting uh, interventions that can happen in food systems in urban areas which contribute to many, many other areas. And I think that's really what we must be looking at in terms of effective interventions on, uh, in food systems is looking at them from the perspective of how they really, uh, how they, they really link, I think, directly to livelihoods. And that's where um, I think the narrative that's emerging from, from African countries more and more, uh, both in the political space and I would say in the civil society space is that there, there is the opportunity to design systems um, within Africa which are not just dependent on, on uh, foreign aid, for example. Of course, if there is some of the aid available, use that perhaps to kickstart certain processes, but look at systems. I mean, for example, investing in urban uh, food system production uh, by creating these uh, small and medium enterprises, you're actually creating a, uh, uh, you, uh, you are creating a, uh, a livelihood opportunity uh, which creates multi which, which creates multipliers. And the, the work that we've done on investing in this kind of green recovery, where you're looking at sustainable uh, investment in, in agriculture, uh, you, you get a much higher return than if you uh, focus simply on, for example, um, high level fossil fuel type investments. And we saw in countries such as South Africa, uh, returns which were very significant, the multiplier effects were 420% more um, if you were to invest in, for example, a, uh, a sustainable food system, which was integrated um, across the, the sectors, meaning that you're looking at getting the maximum number of your inputs from the local environment uh, and, uh, and, and as much as possible, reducing the carbon footprint of those, of those inputs. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to actually design systems that speak to those issues. I think that there needs to be um, a high level of regulation, for example, at continental level through the African continental free trade area that would put certain standards. And then there needs to be at national and even at local level, um, a uh, stimulation for the types of food production that, that are necessary. And I think one of the main areas would be uh, the availability of finance as a, as, a, uh, as a lever, as an incentive. And even though we always say, well, the finance is what's missing, the private sector can be mobilized to invest in these, in these areas. Uh, the question is, is how it's structured and making sure that the returns actually benefit people um, in whom we are investing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm starting to see questions appearing in the chat and we'll come to and uh, encourage as we start to move towards the last part of the of, of today's uh, webinar that you, you put your questions in there, we'll certainly come to those. But uh, Jean-Paul already has raised what is somewhat of a hot potato, I think, in the context of the city of Cape Town which is the role of, of, of urban production. Um, we have a number of sites of quite considerable contestation between city authorities, private sector developers, and, and small scale farmers. And I think this is something that I'm quite sure Namandi would have something to say. And I think Jane, this is something that you and I think some colleagues in the audience have been involved in. But let me see Namandi, what is going on in, 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 in the, the place where you live as regards to urban urban cultivation, urban production? Um, we have quite a few market gardens around. Um, and I'm actually just thinking about your question earlier about the nutrition in, in children. Most of these gardens are actually um, based in schools. But what we found out is that the children actually do not even have access to the gardens that are in schools. 
um, the so it, 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 it's just an individual who goes to a school and asks for a space to farm. Um, but probably not even harvesting some of, a, of their harvest um, for, the, for the feeding scheme at the school. So currently we have quite a few, but we do not have, we haven't really grasped the local market yet. Uh, we've got very little support from the local people themselves. Um, what excited um, local farmers was the, you know, the money element, um, the profit element of it. So they're happy to have a marketing company take the produce, package it nicely, box it and have it delivered to a community um, of people who actually request um, organically grown um, food. So that is where we are at the moment. And we also struggle for inputs and we also struggle for support from the government itself. But where we lack most is um, capacitation and, and training. Um, we are, as, as urban farmers, we are not really, um, we haven't really grasped the planning of how do you plant for a, a whole year's harvest? So what happens is someone plants a whole half of their farm for a particular produce and when it's harvested, everything is gone. So the following week, when you're requested to supply, you'd have to wait another three to four weeks. So that's there's also another gap and there's also another lack. So in as much as we would want to speak to these supermarkets and ask them to buy our produce, the question still remains, are we, are we, will we be able to, to still um, maintain the constant supply? So the better chance is for the local market, but still, you know, we that's that's another gap and that's another area that still needs um, a lot of focus on. Jane, would you like to talk about the hot potato of urban cultivation in Cape Town? Sure. Um, I mean, I, you know, we, we've done some work on the Philippi Watercultural Area and also on the other productive areas in, in Cape Town in the, in the kind of commercial small farming kind of zones. And then try to think about kind of the more conventional understanding of, of urban agriculture and peri-urban agriculture. And I think one of the challenges we found, we did a report for the city of Cape Town some years back. One of the problems was that there's simply not the data that's going to enable the city to make decisions about protecting the land. But that data is not there because of the way in which the, the problem is being framed. So, you know, urban agriculture as supported by city and province has been seen predominantly as a kind of livelihood strategy and a kind of individual food security strategy. So there's been no measurement of, of what's being produced. So it's really difficult to make a, a case. At the same time, the way in which borders and boundaries have been set up, it was really difficult to get a sense of how much food was being produced in Cape Town and consumed in Cape Town. And this partly feeds out of this notion that actually food is something that comes from elsewhere. And so we don't really need to, to have very strong metrics of that. And so when decisions were being made about which agricultural land should be protected, we looked at the agricultural land valuation review that had been done by, by the city or done by consultants for the city. And the way they'd framed the most valuable agricultural land was the land that was had high heritage value, had high kind of soil productive value, but also the stuff that was producing the most economic value which meant that the most protected lands were the vineyards and not the, the kind of horticultural land. And so it's partly around how, how we envisage the food system. What are, we, what are we valuing? And what you measure according to what you value, and then you can make decisions according to the data that you've got. So if you're, if you're not asking the food question about how much is being produced and you haven't got the metrics, it becomes really difficult to, to protect that land. And so I think it's partly that we need to, we need to reframe what we think is important in terms of food. And in the city context, and this is not just Cape Town, it, it hasn't been seen as, as an important problem because food is assumed to come from somewhere else. And so everything else is just kind of nice to have an extra and not foundational. So I think we've got to shift our understandings of what, what it means to have a local food system. I think that relates to one of the questions which is in the chat, which is, recognizing that as we start to see more and more effects of climate change, we might start to think a little bit more about where food comes from and how, how it actually gets to us. Um, very relevant for Cape Town, which is in one of the most vulnerable areas of, of South Africa in terms of the impact of greater variation of, of rainfall of, and, of, and of, of extreme heat. Um, 
Jean-Paul, this sounds like something you might be able to give us some ideas around. You know, what, what, what might be ways in which we rethink entirely how, how a city adapts to climate change? And this is a city that's located ultimately in an area which is quite precarious in terms of rainfall. Well, um, unfortunately, my knowledge of, of, of Cape Town is, uh, is limited for me to give informed uh, guidance. But I think that the as much as possible, um, the uh, solutions that work uh, are where you have a mix of different types of, uh, of, of food production that recognize the, the, the varying needs of, uh, of populations. Uh, and that's where I say, you know, I've said before, there will be some industrialization that has to happen, uh, high, you know, to a higher level than it's happening uh, currently. Uh, the, the efficiency of those industrial processes will be important and how they link in with creating opportunities for smaller operators is one of the key issues where interventions are possible. But I think that in urban areas, uh, countries and, and, and cities that have been successful, um, and, and they, they've been very innovative, if you are familiar with a, a country like uh, Amsterdam, uh, they are currently uh, developing what they're calling floating farms, uh, and they're having you know small scale even dairy production um, in uh, in the heart of the city in canals where you have um, essentially barges where you have uh, livestock and they're also involved in in, in planting, uh, and there are there are ways in which you benefit from having these centers of production. Uh, in the city itself, um, in, in, in many different uh, aspects in terms of the livelihoods that they create, and also in terms of the contribution that they uh, make in terms of the uh, vegetation uh, in, the, in the cities. There are, uh, I can point very quickly to an example that we're involved in in Ethiopia as well, where we are uh, encouraging, for example, the planting of fruit trees around the uh, reservoirs that are feeding into Addis Ababa. Uh, and this is critical because it's there is a there is a, a huge pressure on the urban environment. People are coming to live much too close to the reservoirs. This is having an impact uh, by planting the the fruit trees and giving the the uh, responsibility to manage those fruit trees to local communities. We're creating income opportunities for them, and we're also creating a buffer that protects the the water resources that are are then feeding the city. Uh, and of course, it's it's about planting in a way which does not pollute the the water source, and which actually uh, uh, reduces. So they're using uh, types of local apple trees that actually reduce siltation as well of the uh, of the water the water courses. So I think there's uh, a huge opportunity to link the, link livelihoods in particular in the city to food production, uh, and uh, and these are opportunities which should be taken to also reduce the impact. Of climate change on things such as uh, the availability of water and uh, and how they feed into the uh, supplies of, of any major city. Sorry, my example is not uh, Cape Town specific. No, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. Other, I think we had, we had a question in the chat about possible other. What what are some of the out of the box or what, ways in which we perhaps have not been thinking about uh, and, and opportunities that we haven't been exploring? So when we have, we're preparing for the for the session. We spoke a little bit about some of the shortcomings of the food summit, and and the, perhaps the most strongly worded was that of the special rapporteur on human rights, who said the summit was a failure. Um, we thought we'd like not to spend a lot of our time dwelling on that particular aspect, and to spend at least talk about what is what is what what can we learn, what is of relevance to, to the city of Cape Town, but we can't not address that question. Um, and particularly since um, numbers of academics and of NGOs ultimately said they would boycott the summit because of their, the, 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 the role that was being played by, by, stake, by different stakeholders. Um, so I found one of the most striking moments of, this, of the summit, in fact, was the, uh, was the uh, pre-summit in Rome. And I think by now most of us have watched the speech by Jeffrey Sachs, where he made quite strong comments. So I'd kind of start, like to throw this open to any of the participants. I think one of the things that felt that wasn't addressed enough was the role of what's often termed big food, the big companies that drive the value chains, often in the middle of the value chain, the supermarkets, but also the input documents. Uh, I was struck by looking through some of the statements 
as to what came out of it. We are encouraged to have sustainable Sundays where we have climate friendly me meals. Um, the importance of local solutions was, was emphasized. The Food Producers Coalition talked about and managed to get all the words in there, resilient, healthy, nutritious, sustainable, just, inclusive, empowering. So what are your perceptions about the role of big food in the summit, the role of big food beyond the summit, and, and, and what would we expect to happen? What kind of regulations or measures do you think might offset that? And I'll just put that out to see who would like to, to, to have a go first. Then I'm going to take someone. Let, let me say, let, let, me go, let me go to, to Salafina since you were the one that we, we talked about. Let's not, dwell, let's not exclusively dwell only on what the Food Summit failed to do, but also talk about what, what, what has come out of these dialogues. But now let's for a moment think of what, was, what, what were some of the gaps that you feel? Um, so I'll speak from an engagement point of view. You know, we, we were, our aim was to engage as many food system stakeholders as possible at city level. But um, given our platform engagement, these were mostly virtual engagements, um, mostly held in English and, um, and, and mostly coordinated by, by actors out of cities. So what that meant is whoever could access a platform is whoever could contribute or whoever did um, was, within, was within the earshot of a dialogue happening is whoever could participate. And, um, and I think moving forward from this is that if we want to make these as inclusive as possible, we need to make the platform as inclusive as possible. You know, um, if we're in a situation where people cannot access internet or people are, um, how do we bring people on ground into the conversations, you know, do we, um, be, pre to the summit, do we do, do we collect all these different voices um, and then sort of bring all this up to the summit, or do we do we create very accessible ways where you know there's, for example, community halls that are dedicated to to to, to that are closer to communities, but then they are dedicated to to bringing in all these different voices to um, to such global fora, and and I think I want to insist that. We are at a time where we want to move beyond conversations. You know, when we are looking at um, at the challenges faced by the food system, we know at right at the fore the issues around um, equality, inequality, and access, and then also issues around um, weak linkages across the food system. So I think moving forward is um, is how how are we creating first of all identifying actions and going beyond big names such as game-changing solutions, but actually looking at processes um, that can be taken step by step to, um, to address food system challenges. And, and, and I think our contribution to this was to identify some of the critical areas. I did share some of the resources or critical areas or entry points into urban food systems uh, governance. And this can be across um, different, different, different themes, themes of waste, themes of infrastructure, themes of stakeholder engagement, uh, themes of climate action, um, themes of governance, all these are different ways that we can, um, that we can begin to address uh, food systems, um, food system related issues. And, you know, it, and, and in a way this empowers, you know, different levels. If you're at a local government level, then it you empower to address this maybe at a governance um, level. If you are an informal speaker, there's an entry point around um, waste and, and, and that sort of uh, related um, related themes. So we did create that that entry point resource so that different actors along the food value chain or within the food system can see themselves as contributors or as able to contribute to the food system. Great. Amanda, you've already spoken a little bit about this and about the, the, the role of and the links to, to large organizations. Could you... Um, yeah, well... I was one of the panels that actually um, sort of boycotted the, the summit in, in an attempt to bring in local voice because that was actually what was missing. Um, it was missing an African voice. It was missing um, local voice. So all these, I think it was more than 500 um, um, organizations that actually had um, a series of these 
pre-summit leading up to the main summit and they were representing millions of other communities. So that was also the one thing that was missing. I mean, there was, you know, um, there was a conversation happening at the table and we were not invited on that table and the conversation was about us. Um, and also, um, if I may, while I'm on the platform, I'm also looking at the time um, in an attempt to respond. I think there's an anonymous um, question that is posted in the q and I'm not sure if I'll, I'll be able to, to address the question direct, but I can attempt um, on, um, I think that, um, for us, um, we should start having dialogues, take the dialogues to the townships, take the dialogues to the communities, and those dialogues will dismantle the, or attempt to dismantle the current um, food systems, but also establish a voice for the community, also establish um, agency for the communities to unpack, to unpack the stigma that is around hunger, um, and to also unpack this broken system. But I also just want, would like to mention that I feel that the only way that these conversations or these, these, these dialogues would be able to take space take place is if we feel safe in these spaces to openly talk. Um, and that I see it, it will take time. So um, an appeal for external support from um, professors like Jane, who has been actually doing um, it to, to, to support for academics to carry on supporting coal research, there's power in coal research. Um, and I mean, she has been supporting it and she has been able to share with other, other academics. Um, and that also has not been an, an easy journey for her. So she has to push through. So I think that would also be my, my final word. Thank you. I can see Jane is typing an, a que an answer to a question. So I'll leave you to finish your, 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 your typing and I'll go to Jean-Paul just for a comment about the, the the process of the summit? I think that uh, obviously I work with the United Nations and the United Nations is both, uh, I think, an incredibly rich experience, but it can also be incredibly frustrating because the whole process of the UN, um, no, uh, and in, in, the, uh, in the theory, no voice should be louder than any other. Uh, the reality, of course, is that um, the same economic uh, disparities that affect the world are also often brought to bear in through UN uh, processes. And I think we have to recognize that as, as one of the issues at the outset. And uh, the big food uh, uh, angle or, or uh, the problems associated with big food are, uh, are real and they are uh, some of the biggest barriers to, to achieve sustainable food systems. Uh, but the, uh, I, I believe as well that the engagement with some of these bigger operators will also be part of the, the solution. Uh, and the, I think a lot of it starts in terms of what, it, it starts from the, the, the regulation at the level of national governments. Uh, we have tended to prioritize overall uh, the, the availability of, of cheap uh, food as quickly as possible, where with, uh, with minimal, I would say, uh, looking at, at how that impacts overall production systems. And I think that is one of the biggest failures uh, that we currently have. So you may have, uh, in Africa, for example, you may suddenly have a, because somewhere in Asia, they are producing something very cheaply, it may suddenly be available in Africa for a period of time and suddenly everybody has access to it. Um, but that's not, uh, that's not allowing a local uh, small scale farmer to invest because they may be able to produce something at a competitive price, but maybe not as cheaply as that particular time of, of, of year. And I think uh, we need to be looking at the predictability of the of, of investment in food systems in Africa as one of the key things uh, going forward, because the, the volatility of our food systems, I think, are one of the biggest barriers uh, to investment. And a lot of that volatility is being driven by big food producers. So I think through the regulation that can be done at government level, but also I think increasingly even at regional level through the African continental free trade area, we can create uh, standards and predictability for investors at different levels, which would include right from the uh, micro and small and medium enterprise uh, to uh, larger enterprises, and as well as the, the big food uh, producers and making sure that they are actually contributing 
to a sustainable value chain. And if we don't define what that sustainable value chain looks like, and I think that's the problem, one of the major problems that we have right now, we are not looking at what each, we're looking at the end product, meaning how the, what the product on the market uh, and that it's, uh, it's cheap and available, but we're not looking enough at the, the mechanics of the system. And I think that's where our focus should be. And Jane, would you like to give us a last comment before we, we wrap up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a reflection on, on the Food Systems Summit, you know, Jess Fanzo, when she was asked what she thought of it, she just used one word, which was underwhelmed. Um, and I don't think, I think we maybe we went into these things with too much expectation about what a Food System Summit could do, and even what the opposition people's summit that, that was set up could do. I think what we need to recognize is that what's, what's happened is this has provoked a lot of conversations amongst people who are agreeing with each other and people who are disagreeing with each other. And it's exposing what are some of the challenges in the food system um, and what are some of the challenges with some of the, the solutions that have been, have been offered. And so I think the real long-term impact of this is going to be the networks that emerge out of it and the conversations we continue to have at the local scale in trying to figure out how we make our food systems much more just, equitable and sustainable. Over. I think that's a very nice way to bring it together. Um, the dialogue that we just had in the, as an example of that conversation that just keeps on going. Um, certainly, I feel we started our Center of Excellence in Food Security in 2014. And at that point, food security wasn't spoken about all that much. And when it was spoken about, it was about, is there enough food? And food systems were very, almost certainly not discussed. And the notion of a system really focuses, focuses us on the, on the relationships between the different parts of, of a system, whether they are relationships between people or between us and the environment. Um, I thought the discussions that we've had about what will need Africa as a whole need to be able to transform its food system really interesting. And very recently attended in a, a process that, uh, again, a dialogue that took place in Montpelier um, about a week ago where one of the questions was raised was the role of agroecology and agro a transition to the, and the use of agroecological practices. And a comment from the floor was, in fact, agroecology is extremely advanced science and, and, and an extremely sophisticated way of working with, with the environment, which means that industrial agriculture is in some ways some, somewhat of a steam engine. It's, a, it's, it's from the industrial revolution, if you like, and we need to be looking at far more nuanced ways of working. I really was quite struck by one of the reports that came out of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Food Summit. Um, it's a report that was authored by a South African, Cheryl Hendricks is the lead author, on the true cost and true value of food. And in that report, they, they talk about the cost of food as being something like 19.8, nearly $20 trillion. But the bulk of that cost and that they have estimated is the loss of human life. And it's human life lost through diet, through the inequities of the food system, and like the impact of climate change. So it's a staggering number, but I don't think we can, we can lose sight of the fact that the, that the human cost is really the key that we need to be concerned about in a food system. And that I think is how food dialogues such as this one can contribute towards us thinking about new ways of doing things and learning, even if we're learning from people that we don't agree with. Gert, I think my task is done and I'd like to hand back to you to bring us to an end. All right, Julian, thank you very much. Um, and quite an end. Um, I, in spite of our slightly rocky start, I found that um, a, a very quick 90 minutes going by with much said and much more to be explored. And I'm very grateful to you and to our panelists, Jean-Paul, Jane, Solofina, Namonde. Um, really a great session. And I certainly will be going back to the replay and pulling some of the the real insights out and the recommendations and doing my best to carry those forward. Um, for those of you who were in attendance today, thank you for persevering through the technical issues. Um, if you do want to have a look at the replay, it will be available on the fooddialogues.info platform as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, and if there are others that you know who registered and they weren't able to make it in for whatever reason, please can you let them know about those, those opportunities to view what's, um, what's been shared and said here today. I just want to say a quick thanks once more to our co-host and sponsor, Solve at the Waterfront, to our co-sponsor, the DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Food Security, for making this year's Food Dialogues possible. This will be wrapping up the 2021 Food Dialogues. 
Um, we do have support for the next couple of years at least. And so we hope you will be um, keeping your eyes, ears, and, and digital filters look on the lookout for further information about the 2022 Food Dialogues. Um, and we'll be talking about that after we take a brief break um, and uh, yeah, push, push forward. So thanks again, all the best to all of you for the rest of your day. And we hope to see you again next year.